to worship at Wild Rose United Church and to this beloved community who seek to embody the welcome of Jesus. No matter who you are, where you have been or who you love, there is a place for you here. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister here at Wild Rose United Church. With me uh, and helping to provide the service in the sanctuary are uh, Dan Somerville and Diane McKenzie, Valley Stewart, uh, Corinne Salajano, and uh, Don McIntosh, and others will be uh, providing leadership uh, remotely uh, from, uh, from other locations. Wherever you are, however you are accessing this service, be it on Facebook or on YouTube, um, I hope that you will take a moment uh, to go to the chat or comment field, let us know uh, who you are and that you are watching. Having this record will not only be very helpful for us, it will be very meaningful for us as well. Reminder that um, next Sunday, May 16th at 11.30 following uh, worship is a special congregational meeting to hear a report from the Wellness Hub advisory team uh, and consider uh, their recommendation. Um, so please do uh, mark that on your calendar and contact the office for uh, uh, in information on attending that meeting by Zoom. And uh, this afternoon at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, there is a special worship service uh, of apology and lament for past adoption practices uh, with the moderator of the United Church of Canada, Richard Bott. And so you can find more information on that if you are interested at uh, united-church.ca. This morning, uh, we are commemorating Red Dress Day, which was this past Wednesday, uh, May the 5th, and uh, is a day of memory for Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So parts of the service will be uh, uh, will include participation by our Right Relations team and uh, we'll be marking that occasion. If you want more information on Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, um, I invite you to, uh, to um, go online and search Red Dress Day for, uh, uh, for that information. And now, uh, with a special acknowledgement of Indigenous territory, a member of our Right Relations team, Catherine Fisher. Land acknowledgement. Welcome. I am Catherine Fisher, a Treaty 5 person, a Cree person, and a visitor here in Treaty 7 lands. We are all Treaty people under the conditions of those contracts signed so long ago between the First Nations and the European settlers here on Turtle Island. Today we are gathered virtually in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Pekani, and Kenai Nations, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wellesley Nations, and the Sutsina Nation. This is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We are geographically located where the Bow River meets the Elbow River. The site has long been called Mokinsis by the Blackfoot, also Wichispa by the Nakoda, Guzitsis by the Sutsina, and the birthplace of the city of Calgary. now invite Valley Stewart to light our Christ candle. Dear God, we light this candle to remind us that, G that Christ is present, shining on our hearts and brightening the world. Amen. I called the Holy One in my trouble. I was rescued from distress. I found a place of calm and peace. I was brought safely to my destination. Let us thank God for great love. 
Let us praise God in song and deed. As people of God, we are called to participate in God's renewing and transforming work in the world. Here in worship, we dare to open ourselves to God's staggering grace. Here we offer all of ourselves to the light of love in an opening prayer. Let us pray. We lift our spirits to you, O God, and ask that we might feel your presence. We long to know that Christ is alive and among us. We want to be assured that your spirit is visible in our words and actions. On this day which we set aside to honor the role of mothers and motherhood among us, help us to give thanks for all who have been motherly to us. Rejoice with us for all those, male and female, older and younger, who have shown us your tender grace, mercy, and love. Help all your people to know the gift of love as a mother can give, in and through whatever form it can be found. Mother of us all, you gather us together as a hen gathers her brood, safe under your sheltering wings. Help us all to be your family and to share your maternal love with everyone we meet. Amen. We have a new... Uh, Don, I'm going to switch to my, uh, my headset mic. We have, we have a new worship element, which is the peace candle. The peace candle is a tradition that uh, spreads from congregation to congregation, and it has come to us from uh, my former congregation, Rundle Memorial United Church in Banff. And uh, they say... Uh, please accept our heartfelt greetings and this gift of a candle as a sign of our commitment to promoting God's peace wherever we go. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. Peace is what happens when those who have much do not have too much, and those who have little do not have too little. When the very old and the very young feel supported and secure, parents can feed their children and themselves and all have the opportunity for meaningful work in their community. Let us pray and work for that kind of peace. Now Dan and Valley will be leading us in our hymn, Dear Mother God.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday service. Today, for family time, I'm reading the, the story written by Métis author David Bouchard, We Learn from the Sun. Paintings are by Christy Cameron. We are taught how to live, when to take, when to give. From our elders, we learn how the earth and sun turn. All their teachings are clear, all their lessons are dear. They are simple and fun, we just learn from the sun. First we sit in a round, our legs crossed on the ground, and we place our hands flat on our mother earth's back. <clears throat> with closed eyes, side by side, with our hearts open wide, we are many, yet one, waiting there for the sun. We are small and we're weak, like the wolf, yet unique. We are humble, it's fun, when we learn from the sun. The sun rises each day in the east as we pray. It is huge, it is strong, we are not big, that is wrong. When the sun south we see, we have gifts, you and me. We're unique, everyone, we learn from the sun. When we look to the west, where the sun goes to rest, we are taught to respect from the old to the nest. Then we turn to the north, and our, cur and our courage comes forth. Bare and landscape are white, we find strength to do right. Next we turn our heads high to a father of the sky, and hear beaver advise that we need to be wise. We are told to look down, Mother Earth is the ground. She's the tree, she is snow, where we're from, where we'll go. When we look deep inside and our heart's eagle flies, she is up there above teaching us how to love. You can learn how to live, when to take, when to give. You'll find that it's fun when you learn from the sun. Here's the seven sacred teachings. Humility, wolf, yellow, east. Honesty from raven, red, and so. Respect from buffalo, black, and west. Courage from bear, white, and north. Truth from turtle, green, and mother earth. Wisdom from beaver, blue, and father sky. Love from eagle, violet, are in our heart. The end. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day. Bye. A reading from Acts 6, verses 1 through 9. About that time, while the number of disciples continued to increase, a complaint arose. Greek-speaking disciples accused the Aramaic-speaking disciples because their widows were being overlooked in the daily ministries. The twelve called a meeting of all the disciples and said, It isn't right for us to set aside proclamation of God's word in order to minister at the table. Beloveds, carefully choose seven well-respected members from among you. They must be well-respected and endowed by the Spirit with exceptional wisdom. We will put them in charge of this concern for us. And for us, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the service of proclaiming the word. This proposal pleased the entire community. They selected Stephen a person endowed by the Holy Spirit with exceptional faith, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. The community presented these seven to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. God's word continued to grow. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased significantly. Even a large group of priests embraced the faith. Stephen stood out among the believers for the way God's grace was at work in Stephen's life and for an exceptional endowment of divine power. And Stephen was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose from some who belonged to the so-called synagogue of former slaves. 
members from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and Asia entered into debate with Stephen. God offers us words of life. The living word. Amen. Our focus uh, this month in our journey through the Bible that we're calling 500 Days with the Bible is on the book of Acts. Acts in the New Testament uh, follows the four Gospels and tells the story of how a uh, small religious movement in the uh, Jewish homeland uh, evolved and transformed and became, over the course of just a handful of decades, a thriving religious affiliation throughout the Roman Empire. Here in chapter 6, we have a reading that uh, we don't often hear in church. The lectionary, which is the tool that we use to uh, travel through the Bible in a systematic way in our Sunday readings, doesn't spend a lot of time on Acts. And the time that it does spend on Acts isn't really spent on fascinating readings like today's, which have to do with wonderful things like uh, church uh, governance. I don't know why. I don't know why we don't spend more time reading the bits of the Bible that are about church governance because it's so fascinating, isn't it? Such an interesting topic. Well, hopefully I can make it a little bit more interesting for you. The conflict at stake in today's story is between those members of the uh, Jesus movement, where they were not yet called Christians, the Jesus movement in Jerusalem, who spoke different languages. Jesus and the apostles all spoke Aramaic. Aramaic is a Semitic language uh, originating in the part of the world that we now call Syria. And because of the uh, actions of empires and, uh, and um, uh, uh, emperors and the shifting of borders and the uh, forced resettlement of populations, Aramaic became the common language throughout what we consider the Middle East. And the group of people in the uh, Jesus community in Jerusalem who speak Greek. Greek being the language of uh, Alexander the Great, who conquered just uh, a couple of centuries before and established new empires. spreading the Greek language throughout that part of the world. And so in Jerusalem, you have people who are faithful Jews, followers of Jesus, living in community with one another, some of whom speak only Aramaic and some of whom speak only And what we are told in, uh, uh, in, in, this, in this account, in the book of Acts, is that the, um, the poor widows, the uh, single mothers, the women who, due to the death of their uh, husbands, have uh, no economic security among the Greek-speaking Christians, 
are not receiving an equitable distribution of the charitable goods. Now, before we assume that we know what it means to be a widow, we have to consider some things. First, we have to consider that in the ancient world, it was not uncommon, far, far more common, for a woman of 16 or 17 to marry a man 20 or 30 years her elder. It's not uncommon for uh, a man, even in good health, to die in his early 60s. So, a widow should not be assumed, even the majority of them should not be assumed to be an old woman. We can picture these widows as women in their 30s and 40s, possibly with children, with much to offer, but lacking the economic security that comes from having a living husband. We don't really know why the Greek-speaking widows would be neglected in the distribution of goods, but we can surmise that there might have been some activity going on of uh, volunteers networking between the leaders and those in need. Volunteers making connections, ministering, connecting needs with resources. And if those volunteers speak only Aramaic, if the network that connects those with needs to those with resources is inaccessible to a minority language group, then the hardship becomes very real. It is not remarkable that a minority language group, even in the New Testament, would have reduced access. Reduced access to people of power and influence, reduced access to opportunities, either social or economic, and even reduced access to the distribution of goods for the poor. It's not remarkable. What is remarkable is what the apostles choose to do. I've seen it said uh, a couple of different times in the last few weeks in different places, in different, uh, different venues, that no one willingly gives up power. seen it on Facebook. I've seen it on Facebook in the context of uh, conspiracy theories, 
COVID conspiracy theories. Insisting that uh, the pandemic that we are living through and that many of us are dying from boils down to a uh, government power grab. People insisting that the pandemic will never end because uh, some, somehow, some way, we can imagine that uh, those in power have had a taste of even greater power and will refuse to give it up. But here we have a story in our New Testament about the apostles of the church giving power away. They say to the whole community, we will stop being involved with the distribution of, uh, of food. We, as the 12 uh, closest followers of Jesus, all of whom are Aramaic speakers, will distance ourselves from that aspect of community life. You choose elders who will administer the distribution. Not assistants, not flunkies, but people who will be fully charged with the authority to carry out that ministry. And the community chooses seven men with Greek names. Stephen and Philip and all the other names that John was uh, so generous uh, to stumble over for the rest of us. I'll tell you what occurs to me when I see someone sharing this idea that no one ever willingly gives up power. It tells me that the person who is sharing this idea considers power, privilege, prestige to be the highest value. Whatever we align ourselves with as our highest value, we can fall into the pattern of assuming that it is not only our highest value, but the highest value. So that when we are trying to understand the world around us, trying to understand the actions of others, trying to understand the decisions that are being made. We assume that others are pursuing the same values that we are. So if my self-worth, if my life ethic is based on the acquisition and retention of power, then I will interpret other people's actions through that lens as well. If my life ethic, my choices are based on the acquisition and retention of wealth, then I will assume 
that other people's choices are motivated the same way. If I am always looking for the way to increase my influence, my prestige, then that is what I will see from others. This act of grace on the part of the apostles. This act of generosity. Contrary to prevailing wisdom, contrary to the behavior of empires and kings, contrary to the idea that says the people who complain are a problem. Contrary to the idea that says if you are in a minority position, whether it is minority language or minority identity or uh, minority nationality or minority religion, that you should either conform to the majority or accept your lumps. The notion that says that You should not agitate for more when the path to acquiring more is clear. Simply assimilate and conform. The prevailing view that says even that if you are disadvantaged or underprivileged, or lacking access, that there must be something about you that makes you deserve it. Contrary to the prevailing view that says, if the authorities are mistreating you, you must have acted disrespectfully. Contrary to the prevailing view that says that if you are living in poverty, you must have made some choice to put you there. The prevailing view that says that matters like addiction or obesity, or eating disorders are moral issues rather than social or medical issues. The prevailing view that says that difference or diversity, whether it is body differences or identity differences or culture differences, are a source of shame. Prevailing view that says might makes right and the majority rules. prevailing view that hears the report of the 
study on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, defining the phenomenon as a genocide, and chooses to quibble over the definition of the word genocide, rather than focusing on the heartbreaking scope of the problem. And instead, they choose to orient their life ethic and their choices and their leadership on a value of grace and compassion. and inclusion. There are people in our congregation here at Wild Rose who believe that indigenous Canadians should stop standing up for themselves. Not only in our province, not only in our city, but in our congregation, who believe that our indigenous neighbors should stop agitating for fair treatment. that we should not alter our ways of being in order to uh, redress or reconcile our broken relationships with our indigenous neighbors. and who somehow must believe that the mistreatment of Indigenous Canadians is a thing of the past. When every day Indigenous women and girls are disappearing or being found murdered when every day there is unequal access. Not only unequal access, but racially discriminatory access to opportunities, to support, to the halls of power and powerful individuals. It can be easy to say that the struggles of a minority population are their own. That they should pull themselves out of trouble. Perhaps by forgetting their language and learning another. Perhaps by repressing their identity and projecting another.
perhaps by playing the game of power. when we are afraid of losing privilege, we can be blind to the suffering around us. But if we are willing to really hear the stories of people who are not dead and gone, but are living in our midst, living next door to us, living in our own families. To really hear the experience, the lived experience here and now of people who have done nothing to earn the additional hardship that they face. To really listen to the reports of the government commissions and investigations it gets harder and harder and harder to live our lives oriented on the value of power and privilege. The book of Acts is not only the story of how a small movement in the Jewish homeland became only a handful of decades later a thriving religious affiliation through the empire. It is also the story of how that movement became a world religion with a billion adherents across the world in every nation. And we do it not by holding on to power, but by aligning ourselves and our choices, and our leadership to an ethic of grace and compassion and inclusion. Thanks be to God. The circle me
Relations team of Wild Rose United Church will lead us in uh, the prayers of the people um, with a prayer for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Prayers for the people are brought to you by the Right Relations team. We offer a prayer for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and we will pause throughout this prayer for reflection. The prayer was originally written by uh, Alidia Smith with the United Church of Canada. Creator, remember your beloved children. Remember the almost 2,000 documented Indigenous women and girls who have been murdered. Remember your beloved children as we remember you. Remember us, Creator when we come to you with the hope of spring, seeking love, support, and protection for Indigenous children. We know that all children have the right to a home that will love them, a community that will support their needs, and a society that will protect and nurture them. Yet, we also know that many Indigenous children grieve the loss of their mothers and aunties, live in communities that are underserviced and in a society that is systemically discriminative and oppressive. And so we pray for these children, God. Remember us, Creator, when we come to you with the passion of summer seeking guidance in how to address this national tragedy. Help us to better understand the root causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls. Provide energy and stamina to the faithful people and organizations that are working with Indigenous women to seek justice and healing and ensure that our actions do not add to the further marginalization of Indigenous women and girls. Remember us, Creator, when we come to you with the mysterious bustle of autumn, seeking comfort and healing for those most affected, nurture and care for the women and girls who are still missing. May they be sustained by the love despite the hatred around them. Gather the women and girls who have been murdered. May they find peace despite the violence that has bound them. Comfort the families and communities of the missing women and girls. May they find joy in the memories of their loved ones despite the sadness in their hearts. Remember us, Creator, when we come to you with the stillness of winter, seeking wisdom and peace. Share with us stories from both past and present so that we can better affect the future with our thoughts, words, and actions. Restore for us the stories of those women and girls who are missing and who have been murdered, so that their memory and legacy will continue. Keep us restless until we are all able to find peace. Remember your beloved children, Creator. Remember the grandmas, mothers, sisters, aunties, partners, and friends who have been viciously taken from their communities. Remember the loved ones who miss them. Remember the faithful who have continually prayed to you throughout the seasons and throughout the years and join our prayers with theirs. Amen. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the screen and also available on the website are all of the ways that we can contribute to the ongoing ministries of Wild Rose United Church. Thank you so much to everyone who has continued your offerings faithfully through this time of pandemic. Uh, and thank you to everyone who is doing what you can uh, to, uh, to support this work. All of our offerings further the renewing and reconciling work of God and the church. And as we contemplate our offering, we have uh, another piece of music from Dan and Valley. Take a look around you Tell me what you see People here to worship the Lord Just like you Loving God, all that we have, whether plentiful or rare, is thanks to you. Help us to treat your trust faithfully. Equip us to spread your love and peace throughout the world. May all our offerings and our entire lives be dedicated to your service. Amen. And I uh, invite you to join in the responsive uh, portions of the sending forth printed in yellow. 
Easter is a season, but it is more than that. It is the start of a journey, the path and the destination. Love placed in the tomb does not remain in the tomb. Love once dead on a cross is now afoot in our midst. We are called to be the people of Easter. Let us join God's love on the Easter way. Now may God who creates us bless you and keep you. May God who redeems us smile upon you and be gracious to you. And may God who sustains us look kindly upon you and grant you peace today and always. Amen. Thank you.